Hello and welcome to the Video Creator Show. I'm your host, Grant, and this is the show where we talk to people who have achieved a certain level of success on YouTube. We'll talk about how they do it, uh, their strategies, their, their day job, their life, how they built their life around YouTube, all these big questions that often do not get talked about. But first, the Video Creator Show is brought to you by VidChops.com, an editing service that helps take the burden of editing off your back. Check out VidChops.com to see how you can save yourself tons of time and energy while taking your YouTube channel to the next level. And now, I am here today with Natter from Freak Eating. Uh, how are you doing today, Natter? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm excited to talk to you. Uh, you're a guy who... So, okay, you run marathons... And you also have this YouTube channel where you eat massive quantities of food. Uh, th is, this is correct to say, right? Yes, I, I think uh, I think you found one way of capturing it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm I'm fascinated by you. I, I think you have a, a wonderful way of living your life here. So uh, why don't you tell us about your your channel? I, I know there's lots of eating challenges that you do. You'll you'll fly long distances to eat. Uh, large pizzas or whatever it is so uh tell tell us about your channel and all of the magic that happens on it okay so it's it's been many years now uh maybe a little over 10 years ago when i started my channel and just like you have have pretty much summarized the focus of my channel is eating challenges particularly ones at restaurants i have done things at home where i kind of follow up with whatever the big trend is or i just try to be creative and and think of something that that seems over the top um, but my focus has been, frankly, the man versus food style challenges that um, restaurants will offer. And I, in recent years, I have actually tried to make it so that um, I, I do the, the, the touristy things in the area where there happens to be a very big food challenge. Um, there was a, there's a famous challenge in, in St. Louis where you have to drink five malts, five malts in 30 minutes. And it just so happens there's a lot of tourist attractions in the St. Louis area. So it's a perfect opportunity to see America and, and eat America. And, and um, uh, that's, that's pretty much the focus of my channel. So the, the whole five malt thing, uh, did you just end up getting hammered? Is that, is that what the story comes down to? Well, actually, I did. If so, I'm all here for it. <laughs> Unfortunately, I did end up getting hammered because it was COVID, shortly after COVID, and they refused to do it. <laughs> they refused to offer it. Oh, no. Uh, but the good news is there, there is there is lots of restaurants throughout the country that, that offer eating challenges. And I was able to meet up with a, a fellow competitive eater in a small town very close to St. Louis, and we ate, we ate massive burritos instead. So we drowned our sorrows in Mexican food. Beautiful. That's the way to do it. Right. So... Take me back to the beginning of this channel. Was it as simple as just filming yourself eating uh, an awesome challenge? Was there a lot of thought that went into it? Uh, tell, tell, tell us about it. So the start of this channel, frankly, my freak eating channel was somewhat accidental. I, I never really planned on it. I, through a coworker, I found that these group of guys who had a YouTube channel called Reckless Eating, and... Um, they knew about what I like to do. I would just go to restaurants for fun across town, across you know places that were near me. And um, I met up with them once, and we filmed some of their typical videos, which was eating disgusting things in their backyard. And they would film. And they found that I had a very strong stomach, an iron stomach. And um, the host told me, you know, we really can't pay you anything. Our, our best, The best thing that we can do for you is if you just... Take what you can do and start your own channel, and then we can, you know, promote you. We can funnel viewers in your direction. Um, and that's really where it started, and I tried to find a name. Uh, the, the name Freak, like Freak Eater, was something that one of my friends kind of coined. He kind of suggested maybe we could fit it on a license plate. Unfortunately, the California Department of Motor Vehicles uh, didn't think uh, having the word freak on a license plate was a very good thing. So that, did, that didn't take off, but the name kind of stuck. I, I do I do like to try adventurous things like I'll I'll go to supermarkets and look in the some of the more international food sections. I've eaten things like bean bean paste, uh, bean curd paste, uh, balloon you know the century eggs. 
But for the most part, um, where I have ended up has just been the big food. Um, and that, that is where my channel has found its roots. I, I just was an offshoot, really, of, of these guys who ate disgusting things in their backyard. And then I just had to try mm -hmm. to find, I had to find my own uh, niche, which, which was the big food. Right on. Quite an origin story. So I, a, a lot of questions people have around starting a YouTube channel uh, often involve, like, how do you meet the right people? So in this case, you, you met these guys who uh, had their own eating channel. Uh, how, do, how did you meet them? So I, I was teaching high school. I, I still teach high school, but I was teaching high school history, and the teacher next door was a math teacher. And one evening, I don't know how it came about exactly, but I convinced him to try doing a team pizza challenge with me. And he just he just let it drop. He said, you know, my one of my roommates is friends with a guy who runs a YouTube channel where they eat they eat crazy things. He said, they don't do what you do exactly, but I kind of think that maybe if you met them, you guys could work something out. And then he you know told them about me, and I got a Facebook friend request. It, networking, you know, it, it really comes down to networking, Ooh. and this was something where, the, where it was pretty much dumb luck, you know, there's, I, I didn't go fishing and find these guys, and, and they didn't necessarily come looking for me, but there was a, a third party who just kind of, who kind of connected us, mm -hmm. and and once you're on YouTube, once you're on now the the much bigger social media world, you really have to try to find other people in order to, to grow, like that is... Mm -hmm. And that's been something that I have, have done the whole time. I've always been willing to work with, with other people, kind of to pay it forward the same way the guys at Reckless Eating paid it forward for me. Sure. So it, it sounds like you kind of got lucky meeting these people, but also uh, there's that saying, luck is preparedness meeting opportunity. Yeah. Uh, so you were prepared on some level to meet these guys and to launch this channel. Um, do you think there was anything in your life in particular that prepared you for YouTube? Honestly, I wouldn't say so because in the very beginning, I was extremely awkward. That's, that's, that was all, that was a difficulty I had in the very beginning. And to be fair, even before I started YouTube, I, I thought, I, because I had seen guys on YouTube who did eating challenges. And so just for the heck of it, I would film myself using like a cell phone camera very primitive cell phone cameras back then and i would watch it later and i'm like nah nobody can see this this is terrible this is so awkward <laughs> delete delete yeah so cringy and but working with those guys i mean it, it helps because there was a group of them and i find in, in those days i found that having someone there with me kind of helped helped make me seem less awkward Sort of like how in pro wrestling, when you have someone who's not a good talker, you'll pair them with a talker, a manager, and then that sort of helps. Um, but as time passed, I, I, I came into my own. I really did come into my own, and I was able to, to, to host uh, more mm -hmm. effectively than I was in the very beginning. But if, if I was just completely on my own, I doubt I would have come, come into YouTube. Mm -hmm. I think so what advice... What advice do you have to people who are struggling with, uh, you know, in your words, awkwardness? They they want to be in front of a camera, but they also don't want to be in front of a camera. They want to start a YouTube channel, but there's this fear of how they're going to be perceived, that maybe their uh, charisma isn't where it needs to be. How, how did you get out of your shell? Well, for one thing, I, I would say it's one of those things where if you really want it, just stick to it and keep trying. Uh, I would watch other YouTubers. Um, sometimes, I'll, I'll be very honest with you, for a while, I tried to form sort of a character um, who was halfway between two other YouTubers. You may, I don't know if you're familiar with LA Beast. He's a YouTuber who uh, eats ridiculous things. Oh, no. On, on camera, he is, he is a very loud, he's a loud, aggressive kind of guy. Um, in real life, that's not him at all. He's a very quiet, laid-back man. Um, so I tried to formulate sort of a character to pretend on camera that I'm sort of like that. And, you know, a lot of people who watched my videos, they, they saw through it. So as time passed, I, I just learned to just be myself. I became more comfortable. But sometimes that, that, that is a way to help. You know, forget that you, you're, you are you and, and pretend to be someone else. Uh, 
uh, kind of tap into some acting skills. Hopefully, you have some some passable acting skills. Mm-hmm. Um, and another mm-hmm. thing is is to work with other people. Like you don't have to be a one person show. So someone like myself, to be totally honest, um, I could be very awkward alone, especially if you're filming in a, in a room where there's no one else with you. If you're okay with being a duo, if, if that is an option, if you have a group of friends, well, that can be another way of breaking out of that shell. And, and you, can, you can feel sometimes just being with another person uh, on camera will make you feel less awkward. Sure. And I, I like what you said about having a character, too. That is absolutely yeah. something I did when I was launching my channel, Teresicle. Uh I, I didn't speak in my speaking voice at all. It was not natural at all. Uh, I wasn't shown on camera. It was only voiceover with, like, gameplay footage and silly animations that we put over it. Okay. But, um, yeah, you, you don't have to be yourself, at least at first. Now, when I'm hosting a video... My energy is pretty close to my normal speaking voice. You know, it's a little more, a little more uppity, a little more energetic and vivacious. But uh, ultimately, it does feel more conversational than when I first started. And I totally agree. Like having a character that y- maybe it's an exaggerated version of your favorite part of yourself. That you know, the the part of yourself that is a little more extroverted, that is a little more energetic or silly or uh, not self conscious, whatever. Um, you know, your character can play into that aspect of you and you can play it up. And at some point, uh, you know, for the people listening, you, when you spend enough time as a character, you kind of, it becomes a part of you and then you can start your, your natural self becomes almost a little like that character and you don't want to take it too far. You don't want to be, you know. Uh, being zany at Thanksgiving dinner or something, but uh, <laughs> you know, it, the point is, you get more natural over time when you're hosting these videos. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So uh, now, now that you're about ten years into your your YouTube career, uh, how do you feel your life is different now versus back then? Well, for one, I feel very comfortable in front of a camera. I, I don't know if that's if that's a good thing or not, but um, I'd say it is. Yeah. Uh, what else? I mean, I'm at a point. Like, there were moments when I I believe that YouTube might be a full time thing, full time job. I have accepted that it, it's not going to be, but it's an incredibly fun hobby. It's something I still enjoy doing. I still set aside time for every week. It's frankly something that. I do have to fit into my life and, and work my life around. And it's it has taught me time management in a, in a strange way. Um, it's also taught mm-hmm. me, you know, the importance of planning. Uh, you know, write, you, I do voiceovers in a lot of my videos, and so I, I do kind of write out scripts. A lot of people don't see those, actually, and that's a lot of behind-the-scenes sort of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. So I get to practice a lot of, a lot of things that I enjoy. Uh, even if a lot of people who see the finished product don't don't see all those steps, um, but I would say it's it's a it's a hobby I really enjoy and I will keep doing it until I suppose I can't. Sure. And so, uh, as far as YouTube being a job and producing income, uh, what ways are you monetizing your YouTube channel? If you're comfortable talking about that. Oh sure. Um, honestly, I have monetized uh, through the AdSense program. I. There were some short periods where I was uh, with a partner network, uh, but I felt that they weren't doing much for me. I know they, I know there's mm-hmm. still many of those networks that still exist. I have never, I have never joined one again. Um, yep, good call. <laughs> I have, um, I've also received offers. This was, this was when I, when I was part of uh, the net, uh, a network. I had received an offer to live stream on a third party app. Um, I don't remember even the pay rate, but there was a certain number of dollars if you live streamed on this other app. Um, some of those opportunities have come up. In the past, I have sold merchandise. Um, it was never a major, a major uh, part of what I did, and I never got into all the the online stores. T- the world of today is much different. It's much different than what it was if you were a creator seven or eight years ago. Mm-hmm. Like it, it just I, I look at things today on Instagram and TikTok and I'm like, man, it's just a whole new world. It, it yep, really absolutely. is. Absolutely. And uh, so the 
that's one thing we haven't really talked about on this podcast yet is the idea of MCNs, so multi-channel networks. Um, I feel go. like they were more common back in the day on YouTube. They're, as you said, they're still around. There's still plenty around. Uh, my channel was also signed with one. Uh, it was under Maker Studios. And a lot of the contracts that are offered to YouTubers are terrible. Uh, yeah. My advice generally is just don't sign with them. Uh, and just for anybody who maybe is getting emails like, oh, this big company wants to partner with me. Uh, I mean, I've had companies who they were like, oh, we'll take 30% of your AdSense revenue and you'll have access to our music library and we'll help optimize your channel. Uh, I mean, it's like, what? I mean, you're not giving me anything and you're going to take 30%. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is so dumb. Um, but like, if you, I think, especially if your channel is first starting out, right? A, a lot of people... Um, they get this email when their channel is really tiny, so they're like, 30% of nothing is still nothing. Um, yeah. But no, it's still still a bad idea. Uh, would not recommend signing with these people unless you have a really good reason. I think um, we ultimately were able to negotiate like 10%, and then we were able to get like free trips to Disneyland because Maker is owned by Disney. Um, and so, I don't know. Anyway, that's uh, enough about me uh in my general advice there i'm glad you got out of your uh mcn could you tell us a little about the deal that you were signed under i was with full screen now i'm not sure if uh, offhand mm. i don't know if they still exist or not i i don't pay much attention to them um i'm trying to remember i believe it was an 80 20 agreement mm. and it was it's interesting because i remember they would they offered you the free music library and occasionally they would offer you a promotional opportunity. You could make an ad, and then you know you'd be paid some number of fixed dollars for the ad. And of course, um, you know the viewers would hate those sorts of videos because they understood it was paid. And I, I don't know if that sense has changed, but I do remember many years ago on YouTube, and then in that particular era, if you made an advertised video, you were a sellout. Like it was that mm. that was how it was. People would just call you say you sold out. Um, I think as times has changed and YouTube's revenue structure is not the same, I think a lot of viewers are are more aware that it's not as easy for for YouTubers to to just get paid for their content. Kick the big kickback for b belonging to the multi-channel network that I was in is that occasionally they would give you these sponsored opportunities, but eventually that ran dry. And suddenly you were just giving up 20%. And I remember the, their selling point is, we'll open you up to more audiences. I never got that sense that was happening. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I had some organic growth. And over time, it just never seemed like they were contributing to that. The yeah. rate hadn't changed. Mm -hmm. They just yep. found a good way to take, to take a percent, you know? Yeah, and it's part of their business model you know they kind of right. sell you on the things they can do for you and most of the time they don't really deliver um i'd say a solid 95 percent of the time you know if you're like in the top one percent of youtubers uh then maybe you'll be able to sign a deal and they will actually bring you sponsorships but you can get sponsorships on your own like you don't you don't need yeah. uh to promise you know, 20% of your revenue or 10% or whatever it is. Um, anyway, I, I feel like most YouTubers kind of went through that. MCNs fortunately seem less common now. I think a lot of people yeah. are more aware of them too. Um, you know, like Machinima was a big bad one back in the day. I remember and, them, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, you'd like see the Machinima intro everywhere. Uh, so yeah. it was like, oh, I get to partner with Machinima. And then they would take like 30% and lock you in for five years. Or, you know, it was it was bad. It was really bad. <laughs> it was yeah. super scummy. Uh, oh, man. Oh, that man. Was a, it was an era. Like, that was really an era of YouTube when the, mm -hmm. when the MCNs were just running wild. Mm -hmm. Those were the days. So now, now we're in modern day YouTube. Uh, you you are still posting videos, still eating large quantities of food. Right. Um, do you have a schedule that you try to stick to? Uh, it says new videos every week. That's the plan. Um, like how how often do you hit the schedule? Do you recommend a weekly schedule? Frankly, I know from talking to other YouTubers and attending a couple of these 
like YouTube camps over the years, they do recommend a consistent schedule so that your viewers know when to when to tune in. And I've also been told that the more you post, the the more you'll 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 hit that algorithm. Now, frankly, in my life and with the type of content I'm creating, it is very difficult uh, to produce more than once a week. Mm-hmm. Um, once a week for me, because my full-time job makes YouTube now very difficult, for one thing, but also just eating enormous quantities <laughs> is, 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 is a chore. You know, it is. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, if you're on YouTube and you have the ability to create content on a daily basis, if it's some, if that's a possibility, that's where I would I would recommend. Uh, the the more often that you can you can post, you you will get more presence, and you'll mm-hmm. feed into the algorithm. And that's something the algorithm you know does not benefit people who are posting less frequently and and inconsistently. Mm-hmm. So, so your your channel involving eating large quantities of food, you post uh, on yeah. average once a week ish. Uh, how, how is that? Is that like difficult? Does it take a toll? I, I know you run marathons, so you're, you're balancing it out. Uh, you work hard, play hard, so to speak. Um, yeah. how, how, <laughs> what is that like for you? It, it really, it really depends on, on the time. I mean, there's, there are times where I am actually, uh, filming quite a bit. It's it, the hard part is really going back and doing the editing. Uh, you mentioned earlier, I, about about an editing service and you know Mm -hmm. that's another thing that has really come up is is a lot of services that you can that you can procure now to make life easier if if you can afford it Um, because when i started and still now i'm I'm, i still edit my own my own stuff Um, frankly to be totally full transparency i don't earn enough to hire an editor Mm -hmm. Uh, i do get ads and i laugh when i see them in an email because i'm like um I don't make enough here to justify spending what you're charging. Um, It it really does depend. There are, there are quite a few people, quite a few competitive eaters and food challengers on, on YouTube. Um, There are some where that is their life. Um, There are some people I know, they literally travel around the country, around the world. And that, that is their job, their life. Uh, For me, it's, it's pretty much a hobby. Um, so that's what that's partly why my publishing schedule is inconsistent um, but yeah there there's definitely a toll um, when when you're trying to maintain this you have to find time to eat you have to find time to go back and edit so sometimes getting out even a video a week is is not easy mm-hmm. totally so uh your marathon running like does that play into your eating i i'm sure if you finish a marathon that's good motivation to eat six pounds of pad thai huh yeah that would be um no it's it's interesting because uh a lot of the types of food you'll see in my videos are not things that you would want to eat in preparation for for (laughs) running long distances Mm -hmm. absolutely not so usually those meals these big meals would be things i do after a long run or kind of on the the rest days when i'm not uh, prepping for uh, long runs but in, in like a long-term sense like you're saying there is a balance you know on, on the certain days where uh, you know you're more active and on certain days where you're eating more um, i I'm, I'm still probably a little heavier than um i should be uh, to be honest it, it the the impact of large numbers of calories is not easy to to counteract you know if you hear somebody telling you they run 5ks and 10ks and they're eating eight pound burritos and it, it it's balanced like no that's not a balance <laughs> <laughs> there's no balance mm-hmm. i'm sure it helps but uh you know it, it helps more yes. calories like i mean dear god like last night i ate uh, almost a full quart of ice cream and i was like ooh. I went to the gym today, but still, it's uh, you know, if I did that every day, that would that would be a problem. Even like twice a week, you know. Uh, but yeah. But you, sir, I mean, marathons, twenty six miles, that's a that's a big deal. Um, mm-hmm. So, do you feel like running marathons kind of helps clear your head to be able to manage having a full time job and a YouTube channel? Uh, like, it, does it give you a sort of clarity of mind that is necessary to balance all this stuff? Well, actually, I do. I, I that that's a good point. Honestly, what I enjoy most about running is you do kind of get to get away from everything. 
it, you do get clarity of mind. You you are literally by yourself. You know, there's there's no one there with you necessarily. You're not trapped at a desk. You're not you're not chained to a chair. You're on your own, and and you are in your own headspace for for long periods of time. And I do find that it does clear my head, and it does kind of give me a break from from uh, technology and a lot of the things around us. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So what advice would you have for somebody who is just starting out on YouTube? My, my advice is going to sound very, very generic, but I, I believe if you can either find something that no one else is doing or find something that is already being done, but do it better doing better than what's being done because the truth right now on YouTube and the rest of social media, there are just, there's a plethora of people. There is just a huge ocean of people up on the internet who are trying to stand out. It's hard. I do remember when I first started, when I created my channel, I did a search to, to find other people like myself. And quite frankly, there weren't many back in 2010, 2011. There really weren't many. You do a search now, and pretty much every every major competitive eater, lots of minor ind competitive eaters, independent eaters, everything, everyone under the sun who can try to do a food challenge is doing them. You know, it's you know everybody from Joey Chestnut, you know, the hot dog champ, all the way to some guy in some guy in town here. You know, um, so it, to stand out right now is hard, but that that's the, that's where I think the spark has to come from. But it needs to be something that you're passionate about. And if you're just doing something for the views, I, I, I feel that your, your drive will, will, just, will just die. Mm -hmm. I think it's very hard to maintain a drive for something that you're not really passionate about. So that's, 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 that is a, a puzzle right there. You know, find, you, you, that, I remember seeing a Venn diagram on the internet where it's like, things I'm good at. Things people like to see, and then things to get paid for. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, you oh really want to, you want to find that way, right? Yeah, and that's and that's the puzzle, because I mean, obviously, what I do on the internet is not everybody's cup of tea. Mm -hmm. I, you know, that's just that's just how that is. Um, so if you, you know, that's other, that's something else to think about. You know, are you going to create something that everybody is going to want to watch? Are you aiming for that small community? Like, you know, for example, gaming is very popular. I believe gaming is probably more popular than food, you know, or food challenges. Um, but there's lots of gamers. Like, how are you going to stand out, you know, as a gamer? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's the important thing is to figure out how to stand out. Yep. Uh, sage advice, for sure. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm also fascinated by your dichotomy of being a teacher and a YouTuber. Do your students watch your YouTube channel? Uh, do they, are they entertained? Like what <laughs> do your students know about this? Some do. Oh, I mean, over the years, it's inevitable that people will find you. I, I, in the beginning, I kind of had a, I made it a goal not to tell my students. I didn't want to, I didn't want that to be the focus of their classroom experience. Oh my, you know, uh, but inevitably people find you, you know, people will, will search you. Um, I know when I was in high school, I mean, if we hadn't, if we had, we did have the internet, but it wasn't like the internet of today, you know, it was, um, but we would have searched our teachers, but now when you search your teacher, wow, here's, here's, you know, this person's on YouTube, this person's on Instagram, you know, um, it's a different world when you search people today and people will find you, you know, I, I, I have been startled at the way some students have mentioned to me in class, oh yeah, I saw you do this. And then. And then they'll start talking about it. It's like, wow, I can't believe, you know, you drank a gallon of milk and then <laughs> things like that. I watched you and eat then, a 28-inch pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and then parents. So sometimes then the, the parents would then come and and I never, I was always cautious because I was worried, you know. Not everyone likes everything they see and not everyone is going to think that maybe my kid's teacher should be doing this stuff. But I have been amazed in the the positive response lots of them say you know it's it's kind of cool that you know the kids can see you do things uh in your everyday life to see that you're a person that you know you you really are not just a teacher but you have a life outside of this and and for some of the kids they feel you know wow you know you really can 
you really can be, be a YouTuber. Like that's something that can be can be a life goal, even if it's not, even if you're not earning a living doing it. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember these kids uh, many years ago when I had about I don't know sixty thousand subscribers. They were just shocked. Wow, a teacher at our school has sixty thousand subscribers. Is that for real? Yeah, I remember that, and that it just it just blew their imagination. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that made um, you a popular I, I, teacher, huh? A little bit. Um, uh, even kids who weren't my students knew who I was. I um, but I, I never, I never, tr- I never advertised it to the kids. But they would find me. Uh, inevitably, they would just find me. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I just didn't want to have that distraction. Um, thankfully, it's never actually become. A, it's never been an issue with my job. Like I've never been in a situation where I was told, "Listen, you, you're going to have to decide." You know you're just causing a lot of negative press for us or our school. That's never happened. So I'm grateful for that. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. And I, I'm sure it's comforting for other people that want to start channels as well. Cause obviously, yeah. you know, unless you're extremely wealthy, um, you know, you got to have a job before you start a channel and maybe you can get it to the point where you don't need the job anymore. But you know, most people need to have this YouTube channel and their day job coexist peacefully. Uh, and for you, yes. clearly that has not been an issue over the course of 12 years, uh, which is awesome. And you know, yeah, I'm sure as long as you're posting things that are not overtly negative or anything, uh, most people are really happy to hear about a YouTube channel. I mean, every time I talk to people uh, and they find yeah. out I have a YouTube channel, they kind of light up. Um, like, most people are very happy about it. It's it's fun. It's interesting. Um, why would they not want you to do it? So, you know, for, for anybody listening, if you're feeling held back by that sort of fear, you can let it go because it's not really a problem. Yeah. I mean, I, I suppose if I was doing things that were risky, you know, if my YouTube channel was me, you know, you know, doing uh, doing donuts in the parking lot in my car. I mean, I could imagine I could imagine a very negative reaction or. If my videos consisted of me, you know, telling, you know, dirty jokes, um, yeah, you you don't want your kids, you don't want your own children to discover this from your teacher. Um, Mm -hmm. So, like, I could see that being an issue, but, like, one of my coworkers told me, he said, the stuff you post about is just really, it's hard to imagine you. Like, we see you in class here, you seem like a very serious fellow, and, but there's this other stuff where you just seem just ridiculous. <laughs> like, it's not really offensive. It's just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Pounded cheeseburgers. Pounded chicken right. McNuggets. Yeah. He said, because there have been some viral trends, and I I was wise to steer clear of, of many of them. Um, I mean, I, I would never do, like, the Tide Pod thing that people were doing. But, you know, <laughs> there are some trends that are awful. And, you know, hypothetically, had I done some of these really awful trends, I mean, yeah, I could see parents just being irate. I could see the school coming to me and saying, listen, you're, you're a liability. You're supposed to, you know, uphold some, some, be a model of good behavior. And here you are, you know, doing these things that are clearly just not very smart. Uh, But no, I mean, I think if you, depending on what your job is, you also have to, you know, you have to kind of find this balance how much of a public like how much how much danger would it be if people found out what you did and unfortunately i didn't learn right away that maybe it's not a good idea to use your real name when you're (laughs) on youtube Mm -hmm. um so that's actually something that i admire i admire a lot of the the um the newer crowd i wouldn't say younger necessarily because there are some some people who get started when they're a little older um, but I would say it's a good move to start using your stage name mm-hmm. so that just in case you, you do get some separation between uh, what you're doing on YouTube and what you're doing in, in your everyday life. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Uh, and even just uh, yeah. not not broadcasting your last name. Like first names are not a huge deal unless you have a very uh, uncommon one. But yeah, if you can mm-hmm. hide your last name and just like, oh, I'm Grant. Um, then you're right. probably good to go, um, you know, and I, uh, definitely good advice. I've had a lot of people suggest that as well. Uh, yeah. It's just hiding your name because uh, I think maybe when people are first starting a channel, 
they're like, oh, well, that'd be an awesome problem to have. I'm so famous that I weird people are coming up to me. But, oh, my God, when it does happen, uh, I've, I've gotten phone calls, and they were yeah. not phone calls I wanted. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, be careful out there. Be careful out there. Yeah. It's also it also could be a professional concern. I, I do have some. I they don't make YouTube videos anymore, but I did have two friends who were accountants, and they worked for companies that actually had very conservative policies, and they would do their best to sort of downplay their names or not mention who they were. One of them straight out used a fake name, um, just uh, in order so that their company, if they found anything out, they wouldn't they couldn't really take any action. Mm-hmm. It's just it's interesting how different companies will have different different policies. So that's that's something to kind of uh, watch out for. Mm-hmm. Totally. Uh, another thing I, I would say is if you are publishing anything on the internet, just be prepared that somebody may find you. Yes. You know, d- don't be surprised then when someone does confront you in public and say, "Hey, I saw your video where you know you ate this eight pound burrito or whatever." Like. You know, it, it is sometimes when I'm when I'm meeting with parents or with students, it is a, an awkward moment for a second when a parent will, that's their introduction, that's their reference to me. Oh, I saw you do that. And then it's like, well, I had I had a student I was, because I, I, do, I do classroom and independent study, and, and during the pandemic and after a lot of live instruction now over Zoom, um, but there was a parent, I remember the, the, when I was meeting with a student, the student had a problem uh, you know, doing slope and algebra. So here I am, you know, trying to show the student how to solve this problem. And the dad keeps interrupting to ask about these various videos I made. <laughs> oh, like, God. Right, Thanks, right, Dad. Teacher could not hear. <laughs> and I'm like, he just kept asking. And I was telling him, you know, it's it's because he was amazed at how long that I kept it a secret. They just randomly searched me one day. I think that what they were, tr- they, they, they were trying to get my email address. And then they didn't know what to do, so they, they, I guess they just tried to search for me, and then they found me. Wow. And then they were just, the dad was just so blown away, and I told him. It's kind of like the old days, you know, when professional wrestlers, it, it was not, their, not necessarily their only job. Like, those guys would travel from town to town, and they had day jobs, and, and they never talked about them. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like kind of like that for real yeah it's like uh, a, a dual life you know you got your your yeah. online presence and then you got your your day job there's uh clark kent and superman it's they're they're right. the same but different right mm-hmm. yeah i i feel that it can be kind of strange uh i worked a day job and had a youtube channel at the same time for many years uh then i went full-time youtube now i kind of now i'm like freelancing but still in the realm of youtube helping other people build their youtube channels so it all kind of works together very smoothly now but um i'm yeah i'm sure having a you know a job as a teacher is just i mean so different than being on youtube it's uh two entirely different worlds yeah very much Mm -hmm. yeah well uh do you have any last kind of bits of advice or uh, just some some inspirational words for people out there who are hesitant to start a channel but have always wanted to? I would say get out there. You know, you can't – You if you're worried about failing, you don't fail if you don't try, if you don't just get out there. Be yourself. Have fun with it. My recommendation is just don't – don't risk the farm on this you know uh, don't don't take unnecessary like i would say take take the usual like take a safe risk but don't spend eighty thousand dollars on equipment believing oh i'm going to become a millionaire doing this Mm -hmm. you know um i i would say to have fun the the most important thing in this is to have fun and like in many other fields and endeavors it's very difficult to determine your success here. I mean, I'm actually honestly very happy with what I have accomplished on YouTube. I, there was a point, frankly, when I just told myself, when I started to see some growth, I was like, I think it would be cool to reach 100,000 subscribers. Not, not, not that the number really has any value of its own, but I just thought that would be just so remarkable. I was always a quiet kid in the back of the classroom. Nobody you know, hardly ever noticed me. 
I, I was also a nerd, and, and, and just in case you can't tell. Um, but I was like, you know, that would just be a, a ridiculous thing, and uh, just kind of a strange accomplishment. And, um, you know, it was a very good feeling when that happened. And I just, I'll just kind of say that as sort of as a, it is something that I guess I can point to other people and say, you know, even if you started your life one way or, or you had your skills in one direction, it, lots of things are possible. Mm -hmm. So, so don't, don't feel limited um, because you don't think that people will watch your videos. Frankly, if you search through YouTube, <laughs> search through other social media platforms, there is videos of everything under the sun. I mean, there is someone who will watch your videos. I've seen videos of people shining shoes. I mean, it's out there. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of things out there. Yep, sage advice. Uh, and, yeah, and um, yeah, no, it's it's amazing, frankly, how just the opportunities that are, that will come about because you're on YouTube. You know, you'll you'll kind of learn to walk around and ready to film, like, and that's not something that that um, was in me when I started this. You know, and and I'm actually became much more comfortable with cameras on camera, and then to flip it around, I actually it actually helped me quite a bit during to do live teaching on camera because mm -hmm. of YouTube. So you know the the two worlds kind of kind of you know melt into each other, uh, and YouTube gave me some skills that actually worked out better in in the real world, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, That's awesome. So. I, I would say, you know, go for it. Just absolutely go for it. Just do it. Make your yeah, dreams you come true. It's all true. There it's all go. it's all extremely true. Uh, I love your advice. I didn't want to... Yeah, I appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks. I just I just didn't want us to get sued by Nike. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, or Shia LaBeouf. Right. Mm -hmm. They they both got money, so we got to be careful here. That's true. Mm -hmm. And he, we're we're at their mercy. But I like to think it was a positive endorsement here. And, uh, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm sure they will be very nice about it when Shia LaBeouf watches this. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, the channel oh. is Freak Eating. And why don't you tell people where they can find you, uh, your socials, uh, anything else you'd like to pitch. Yeah. I just like to say thank you for having me. This was a wonderful experience. And one of those experiences that came about because I got onto YouTube. Um, you never know where it's going to take you and, and, and the people you'll meet. Frankly, if you're looking for me on the internet, pretty much anywhere, any any social media account with the name Freak Eating is is almost definitely me. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. I, I've learned to change with the times and just and and right now the those ridiculous short videos seem to be the way to go. So, so mm -hmm. sorry, there it is. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Well, there you have it, everybody. And no matter what platform you're watching on, make sure to follow, subscribe, like, whatever it is, so that you can uh, hear my voice in the next one. Uh, and with that, thank you so, so much for being here. And uh, I will see you all later. Bye, everybody. <laughs>